All right. Good to have everybody here. Roy's checking the parking lot out, make sure we're all safe. Brian got my gun cleared. How hard was it to get out? I was doing something else. If anybody can make that kind of mistake, that would be me. Did you? That's how you knew how to get it out. They wouldn't even let me join. I signed up to join the Boy Scouts. When I was in school, they came by the school and said they had enrollment. So I signed up for Boy Scouts, got a year's subscription to Boy's Life. They said they would call me. They never called. Never called. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think God was probably watching over me. Revelation chapter 2. Are you glad you're here? Say amen. 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 Pray for those that are still sick uh, with the China virus and um, those who have passed. It's a it's a bad it's a bad sickness. It really is. Having had it, I can tell you it's pretty bad. Brother Sterling's getting around that the house pretty good, but he's still attached to the hose that uh, feeds him oxygen. He's not gotten to a point to where he can get just a bottle to carry it around. Uh, hasn't got there yet, but uh, he's planning on it. So just keep praying for him. All right, Revelation chapter 2. Um, I mentioned that I was going to bring this up last couple Sundays, and I kept forgetting to do it, but I am going to do it today. Um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 is what I have up on the screen. He said, I know thy works. This is Jesus speaking to the church at Smyrna. And he said, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Uh, so I told you I was going to talk a little bit about replacement theology. Hold your place there in Revelation and turn to Genesis 12. I have believed this for I guess pretty much all of my life. And, um, but some, some preachers that I, that I grew up under, uh, in the denomination that we were in, uh, and these, these are men that I looked up to. These are men that I loved their preaching. And I would say that they're good, honest men. Um, one in particular, I, I had him come here to preach a revival for me here at Bethel. And it's been years ago. And he, um, we got to talking about prophecy and so on. And he told me that he used to be, I guess like um, he used to believe in the literal thousand year reign of Christ. And, but then he had changed his mind. And I guess some other preachers changed his mind for him that he no longer believed that God held any special promises for the literal genetic seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And I listened to him talk a little bit and I was a little discouraged by that. I, I still love the man. He's still alive. He's still preaching as far as I know. And if I were to mention the name, some of you would, might know who I'm talking about. Um, but he had, he had changed his opinion. So in 1997, when God had a little talk with me and said, Michael, we're going to study prophecy. When I said I threw everything out, I threw everything out. And, but the promises that God made to Abraham and to the seed of Abraham are unchangeable promises. If God, if God changed his mind about the 12 tribes, where does that leave us? 
In other words, if God made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons, if God made promises to them, and then God, and those were non-negotiable, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They were promises without any conditions. In other words, God, God didn't say, if you do this, then I will do that. In, in Genesis 12, if you look, Verse 1, now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. He did not lay any conditions on that promise. And he said, I will bless it. Verse 3 is where it is. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, he made that promise to Abraham. He made it to his seed after him. And um, I remember going to a uh, camp meeting down in Arkansas. Brother Reg Kelly preached a message specifically on this issue. And I didn't know it at the time. But I had Reg here several years ago with two other preachers and I'm not going to give their names because they're still friends of mine. I love them. But one of the preacher's wives got into it with Reg on the issue of who is Israel because she believed that she was a true Israelite because of her ancestry being Caucasian. Okay? And I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a minute. Uh, not real Jews. Let me explain what replacement theology is. It teaches that God no longer regards the genetic seed of Abraham as a chosen race or family of people. That God has discontinued any promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes. The promises God made to Israel <clears throat> in their minds are metaphors. In other words, they are symbolic to those of us now who are Gentiles by birth, who are not of the seed of Abraham, but are Gentiles by birth, that those promises now apply to us and if someone who is a Jew happens to get saved, then so be it. But God is not going to restore anything to them as a people. They are used as metaphors and that the church replaces Israel as the recipients, as the recipients of those promises. That's what replacement theology is. It says that the church now completely replaces Israel and any promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes, they're now symbolic. How could you, how could you defend against that doctrine? And there's some things that are just, it's easy. And I had a conversation with Brady Crum over this years back when he was a Jehovah's Witness. And I'll tell you a little bit about what they believe here in a little bit. But I asked him this question back when he was Jehovah's Witness. Turn to Revelation 7. Revelation chapter 7. Know your Bible. In Revelation 7, there are two distinctive Different groups of people mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. It says, oh, let's see here. Let's pick it up in verse 2. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in 144,000 
And what does it say after that? Of all the tribes of who? Israel. Then, if you look at verse 5, 6, 7, 8, it names all of them. Starting with Judah, which is interesting. Judah was not the firstborn. He's fourthborn. But it mentions Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, um, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Benjamin was the last son born. It mentions all 12. It actually leaves one group out. It actually leaves who out? Does anybody know who it leaves out? Dan. Dan. Poor Dan. What did he do? But it left his name out, I think, for a reason. I think him and Judas Iscariot sort of are a match to one another. Judas having being kicked out of his office for betraying Christ. Dan having done the same thing. But then in verse 9, after this I, I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So we have a separate group here. One that is mentioned, mentions the 12 tribes and their names. Then in verse 9, it mentions a separate group of all nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues. That's all the Gentiles. Whether they are Caucasian, African, Indian, Asian, Russian, a mixture of all of them, it doesn't matter. I think if you go to Google and send them your DNA, they'll tell you what all you got in your family line. You'd probably be surprised at what you got mixed into your gene pool. Okay? I'd fa I, would, I would probably say that probably there, are no, there is no such thing as a pure race. Okay? But anyway, you, you clearly have two groups. One of them is mentioned as the tribes of Israel and they are sealed with the seal of God in their foreheads. That sealing, if you want to know what it is, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. First and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Um, he said in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13... In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So that's the seal of the living God in them, is that they are receiving the Holy Spirit. Just like God said what happened to them. So, in order, in order to, re, to say that the Gentiles now replace Israel... You have to not read the Bible literally. You have to say to yourself, it says tribe of Judah, but it doesn't really mean tribe of Judah. Is what you have to say. Similar, and some of those who re replace Israel don't believe in a thousand year reign. So you're looking at where it says a thousand years, but you have to say to yourself, it doesn't mean a thousand years. It doesn't mean that. Even though it says it, it doesn't mean it. And I just believe, and this is what, this is where God took me away from my Bible college training, was that as I was reading it, God was telling me, you can believe that. If I said it that way, then I meant it that way. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, Jehovah's Witness. And I asked Brady this question. I said, so, and, and the, you recognize the 144,000. Jehovah's Witness teaching says that there are 144,000 of the top, best, most perfect, professional Jehovah's Witness in the whole world and they, and only they, can inherit heaven, can go to heaven. 
Only 144,000 people can go to heaven. Huh? Yeah. By. Hi, we're from the Kingdom Hall. Okay. So when Brady was Job's witness, I would ask him, are you one of the 144,000? He said, no. I said, then why bother? They believe that God's going to let them have the earth for eternity. He's going to perfect it. But they can't go to heaven. They can only remain down here on earth. The 144,000. So I asked him, I said, so let me ask you this, Brady. The 144,000 that Charles Taze Russell talks about, what tribe are they from? And he's, he told me later, after he come out of that, he said they, they believe that those are symbolic tribes. Judah, Issachar, Manasseh, they're not real tribes. They're just symbolic of things. And he said that's how they get around it. But anyway, Jehovah's Witness teaches the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14 are those Jehovah's Witness who have done the most work, lived the most righteous life, given the most to the, given the, most to the Watchtower Society... Only the 144,000 will inherit the kingdom of heaven. All others will be allowed to live forever, but only on the earth, not, not in heaven. And the dead, those who are not faithful enough to live on the earth forever, they just lie in the grave. Now, if I was, if I was lost and I really loved my sin... You couldn't convert me to, to be a Jehovah's Witness. Why? Because if all that happens to me is I die and I rot in a grave, I'm going to dance and party on that one. You don't want to see me dance. That's how I would live if I didn't fear God's punishment of hell and the lake of fire you couldn't talk me into being a Jehovah's Witness. You couldn't do it. So they replace Israel. And let me tell you, the, the message that I heard Reg preach was probably one of the best ones I've ever heard on this issue. He said, if a denomination has in, they have it as part of their faith that they believe that they have replaced Israel he said, God curses them. Because he said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And he said, you will never hear me curse Israel. You'll never hear me do it. And he, I mean, he laid out a really good case. And there was a young man there that I knew. He was a minister. He's a good guy. But he had been taught that way. And I remember he talked with Reg for probably an hour on this issue after that. And I think Reg convinced him that God's promises were, were correct. That they were, they were awaiting. He's got certain promises that he is going to give to Israel as a nation. Not, not every Jew. Not every Jew. But God is, has reserved those who are going to believe in Jesus, the Messiah. You remember what Elijah was all bummed out about? He was, he was really upset because he said, I, 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 uh, it is enough. Now, Lord, take away my life for I'm not better than my father's. No one believes in you anymore. I, 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 am I the only one left that believes in you? And God said, Elijah, trust me. I've got 7,000 reserved that have not kissed Baal. And I think that 7,000 is a foreshadowing of Revelation 7 and what's in here, the 144,000. God has them. He knows who they are. They could be already born now. I don't know. But he is going to give them of his spirit. The Mormons. The Mormons have a version of replacement theology. They, they were told by Joe Smith that the American, the Native American tribes 
were descended from what's called the Ten Lost Tribes. How many have ever heard of the Ten Lost Tribes? Okay, did you ever read that in the Bible though? You've never read that the Ten Tribes of the north part of Israel are lost into oblivion. You've never read that in the Bible. God did take the king of Assyria and he promised this. He, he, he sent the king of Assyria with his troops, gathered up all the Jews and took them out of the northern part of Israel and held them hostage. And that was a signal to Judah and to Benjamin saying, see what I did to them? I'll do it to you if you don't straighten up. Well, they didn't straighten up. So God sent Nebuchadnezzar after Judah and Benjamin and took them into captivity for 70 years. But we know that by the time Jesus comes in the Gospels, in the four Gospels, that you have Jews who have migrated back to the land of Palestine. We know that from Scripture. I can't remember who it was that was from the tribe of Asher. But somebody mentioned in the Gospels was an Asherite. And so we know that they mig migrated back down in there. They have scattered all over the earth. Most of them live in New York and Hollywood. Thanks to Adolf Hitler, who massacred probably over six million of them simply because they were Jews. They had committed no crime. They had done no wrong. And history does repeat itself. You hear what I'm saying? But anyway, Joseph Smith taught that the Book of Mormon taught that the ten tribes migrated over into America and were the Native American Indians. The Cherokee, the Apache, Pawnee, Shawnee, you name it. That they were the ten tribes of Israel. And that Jesus visited them after he was crucified and rose again. And before he ascended into heaven, he made a trip over to America and visited with the Israelites, the Mormonites or whoever. But anyway, that's they believe that they were from the ten tribes of Israel, and that Christ visited them before he ascended to heaven and gave them a new gospel, a different gospel. Catholicism. Vatican teaches that because the Jews killed Jesus, that God has chosen the Catholic Church to be the recipient of all their promises. Okay? So, the Catholic Church believes that they have replaced Israel. Um, who's ever been to the Passion Play in Eureka Springs, Arkansas? You never been, Melissa? We used to go as teenagers. Okay. And I don't know if you remember this, but they had uh, a museum there called the Christ Only Art Gallery. And I remember going in there and it wasn't the Christ only art museum it was a few paintings of Jesus with a lot of paintings of Saint this and Saint that and Saint who and Saint what but the Catholic Church in Europe used to put on passion plays and they would emphasize that Christ was killed by the Jews and the Jews were in these different cities in Europe, all throughout Europe, Spain, France. They were in France, they were in Germany, they were here, there, everywhere. And the Catholic Church used to try to stir up hatred against the Jews for being the ones who killed Jesus. I mentioned last Sunday, Henry Ford, Father Coughlin, Mel Gibson's father was a, a follower of Father Coughlin, who was a Roman Catholic priest in America, who was a rabid anti-Semite. And so that's why they accused Mel Gibson when he made the Passion movie that he was trying to, that he was being an anti-Semite by making that movie. Then we have 
British Israelism or Anglo-Israel. I was asked several years ago by somebody, um, this before I started doing the Watchman broadcast, to research a book. This lady handed me a book and she said, I believe it, but I want you to research it to tell me what you think. So I looked into it. The book was written in the late 1800s. And it was written by a man who said that the ten northern tribes, because they were taken north by the Assyrians, that they migrated up through the Caucasus Mountains, which is where the word Caucasian comes from. And then they settled in England, Ireland, and Scotland. So that... If you are of Irish or British or Scottish descent, you are one of the ten lost tribes of Israel. So I started finding these websites from churches, most of them in northwest Arkansas. Does anybody know where the headquarters for the KKK is? You want to take a guess? Northwest Arkansas. And if you were looking for a skinhead neo-Nazi church to join, that's where I would go to join one. Because they're down there and they're thick as dog's hair. So, after, and I read these churches' faith statements who believed that because they were white, Caucasian, of British or Anglo descent, that they were the ten, and the ten tribes. And they, their idea is, this is why God blessed America so much, is that we're really Israel, we just don't know it. And that when Jesus comes back, he's going to set up New Jerusalem. Guess where? Northwest Arkansas. The family that built the Passion Play in Eureka Springs built a replica of the city of Jerusalem. Why? It is because they believed this doctrine. That when Jesus came back, he was going to come back to establish his kingdom in northwest Arkansas. So I, I'm reading these church doctrinal statements. And I am stunned because they are in no uncertain terms saying if you are not white Caucasian and of British Anglo descent, you are not ever going to heaven. It doesn't matter what you believe. You're never going because... The promises were only made to the tribes of Israel who came up through the Caucasus Mountains, who are the Caucasians from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. And there is some, some evidence, I don't know how true it is, that the royal family has this in that this is part of their thinking. They, huh? Well, if they say they are from the tribe of Dan, guess what? Revelation 7 says, they're not going anyway. But I know what you're talking about. London, Danbury, uh, any place where the word Don or Dan is in a British town name or a Scottish town name or Irish town name, they say that's the tribe of Dan. He left his name everywhere. But anyway, so their doctrinal statement basically says, if you're not white, you're not going to heaven. We don't, and we don't care what you think about us. Okay? So I called this woman who gave me the book. And I said, 
I did some research. She said, what'd you come up with? I said, before I answer any questions, I'm going to ask you a question. Will you be honest with me? She said, yes. I said, do you believe that people from any race can go to heaven? And she said, of course I do. I said, I believe you. But if there were a hundred people in a room who believe the, the doctrine or believe the idea that you believe, 99 of them will disagree with you and hate your guts. You will be the only one out of a hundred who says that any race can go to heaven. Because I'm telling you that practically every group that I researched that believes in... Who remembers Herbert W. Armstrong? Garner Ted Armstrong. They were big in this. That Anglo... They were British Israelites. That they were from British descent, white Caucasian. They're the real Jews. They're the only ones who can go to heaven. Big time into this. And after Herbert W. Armstrong died, the Worldwide Church of God had a meeting and they said, um, we don't... We're going to change some of our doctrine because things he said were just blatantly wrong. But anyway, this doctrine is held by my neo-Nazis, other white supremacist groups, also by Herbert W. Armstrong. It teaches that 10 northern tribes were taken by Assyria, migrated through the Caucasus Mountains into England, Scotland, Ireland, eventually the United States. They believe the New Jerusalem will be built in northwest Arkansas. And I'm... Is another wasp? <clears throat> you know, I'm glad you don't shoot them. I'm glad you just try to swat them. Yeah. <clears throat> But I, I listen, I'm, I'm not kidding you that I have, I have read, I used to get a newsletter from a group that this lady was affiliated with that was full of people who were saying that God had told them to move to Northwest Arkansas. God was telling them to move to North. God was told them to move to Eureka Springs. God told them to move to Harrison. God told them to move to Berryville. God told them to move to all these places in Northwest Arkansas because that was going to be the land of safety when all everything broke loose. Okay, y'all come on in, make yourself at home. Um, but that's that's called replacement theology. And it is it is as wicked as anything I've ever I mean, I expected to find their, their doctrine on salvation veiled or hidden somehow, not plainly on their website, saying if you're not white, you're, you're not going to heaven. If you're Latino, if you're one of these fake Jews named, you know, Rosenstein or Cohen or whatever, you're not a real Jew. We're, us white people are the real Jews. We're the only ones going to heaven. I was stunned. At how blatantly open and honest they were. We do know that Timothy McVeigh had been in some of these compounds, northwest Arkansas, eastern Oklahoma. It reaches into there too a little bit. We know that McVeigh was part of some of these British Israel white supremacist groups, that much is a fact, okay? Because I found plenty of evidence on that one, okay? But anyway, that's just what they teach and what they believe. That if you are not white, there is no way in the world you're going to heaven. And that's just the end of it. That is not how God, that is not how God sees people. They, I mentioned um, when I was teaching in Genesis 4, and I've mentioned this since, that they believe in what's called the seed of Cain doctrine. Or this, yeah, that the serpent actually mated with Eve, and she conceived Cain. And Cain is the serpent seed that exists all over the earth. And you can just spot them by looking at them. Their skin is dark. Their eyes are brown. They don't have white. I mean, even, even in the Book of Mormon, you'll find the phrase white and delightsome. 
And the Mormon church, for years, does anybody know their doctrine on where black people came from? Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, they all taught this, that when the war in heaven took place, that Lucifer and Jesus were brothers. Yep. And <clears throat> there was a vote. Jesus was going to be the savior of the earth. Lucifer got jealous. So he led a third of the angels in revolt against Jesus and Michael and the, all the other angels. And as punishment for the angels who didn't fight in the war, God turned their skin dark and their hair curly and sent them down the earth to be slaves. That was their doc, that was their official position until times changed and they couldn't get away with that any longer. But that, and they, because they had a new revelation now, the, the, whatever apostle, whatever chief apostle was head of the Mormon church at that time said God gave them a new revelation and, and it, we don't, we don't believe that way anymore. But that was their idea. And it's actually in the Book of Mormon about the people who are white and delightsome. Okay? I'm just telling you, that's replacement theology. That's one part of replacement theology. And I'm, and I'm not saying that everybody who believes in replacement theology thinks that way. That's one part of it. But the idea is, God made promises to Israel. Uh, turn to Romans. Turn to Romans 11. And I'll, I'll finish, I'll finish this, finish it up with this. Look at what Paul said. Paul was a what? He was a Jew. Now, if anybody knew the Jews, it was a Jew. In a minute. Paul knew, Paul knew his people. And he, he, at, I told you at one point, Paul said, I'm not going to another synagogue ever. I'm, I'm done. They won't listen. They're trying to have me killed every time I, every time I show up. I'm not preaching to the Jews ever again. I'm going to preach to Gentiles. But here's what he said. Verse, uh, Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, if God cast away his people, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he hath maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they, and I mentioned that a while ago. Lord, they've killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. And God said, Elijah, cut it out. You're not alone. What saith the answer of God to them? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And that is not just a historical issue. It is a prophetical issue. There are Jews that God is going to save. They are, they are true Jews, true Israelites. And so he said, even so at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And I mean, I could, I did, I got a whole teaching on this called the glory of Israel. And you can look it up on YouTube, whatever. And I, and I wouldn't mind preaching it, teaching it again, because I love to teach about Israel. I love to teach. I read this, when I read the story of Joseph and how when he revealed himself to his brethren, he went and fell on them and wept and kissed them all. He was not angry at them. He loved his brothers. And he then, it, he knew that what they had done to him was the plan of God to send him to be the savior of his brethren. And I read that as I'm studying prophecy now in the Bible. And I'm bawling my eyes out going, Jesus, you love your brothers, don't you? So I will preach against the Jews. I will preach against their doctrine. I will preach against their beliefs and I will preach against their cabals and I will preach against all their things. I will not curse Israel. I will not do it. They are the people of God. 
This country is right in backing them. We're not wrong about that. Okay? And, and if you look at the sin in this nation and wonder why God hasn't gotten us yet, we've stood for Israel so far. That may change next four years. Anyway, let's pray. Father, I love your word. It's right. Your, your word is true. Every man's a liar. This Bible settles it. It corrects all of our erroneous doctrines. It corrects all the things, Father, that we are wrong about, that I've been wrong about. This Bible is right. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless people. Open their eyes and help them to see, God, the beauties of your word and the promises that you made. Father, we're the wild olive branches grafted in. We're not the natural branches. Israel is. And you promised that you were able to graft them back in if they would believe. And you intend on doing it. Father, just bless your word now. We pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen.